Good morning. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to um, honor the fallen. Uh, since World War I, there's been 660,000 Americans give their lives for our freedom, and we're going to talk about a few of those this morning. The first we're going to talk about is uh, a former or good friend of mine, Greg Rojo Fronius. Rojo, red uh, for Spanish. He had bright red hair, and uh, we served in the same company. Uh, Rojo was the sole U.S. advisor to the 4th Infantry Brigade in El Paraiso, uh, El Salvador. And on the night of uh, 31 March, a pro-Cuban Marxist guerrilla group known as the Farabuna Martin National Liberation Front, the FMLN, conducted a well-organized attack against his base. A side note, uh, that coordinated attack was actually coordinated by a U.S. spy, a DEA agent who worked for the uh, Cuban government. He was a, dual a, a double agent. While all the Salvadoran officers were hiding in the command bunker, uh, Rojo went out and he led the defense. Three quarters of the brigade was out on combat patrols. Rojo was left behind to uh, command the QRF, the Quick Reaction Force. Uh, the well-coordinated attack, he was outnumbered three to one. He coordinated the attack, ran from position to position, bringing ammo to the Salvadoran soldiers, manned a machine gun, had been wounded several times by small arms fire and stayed in the fight uh, until he succumbed to uh, mortar fire. Uh, he was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry and uh, left behind a wife, a son, and a daughter. Master Sergeant Thomas uh, Mahalik, he was 38 years old. He was a Special Forces Team Sergeant, the most prestigious position in Special Forces. On 24 June 2006, Tom led his A-team and a company from the Afghan National Army on a search and capture mission in Kandahar uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, during the operation, his unit was ambushed from all sides by an overwhelming Taliban force, ambushed with rocket-propelled grenades, uh, mortar fire, and machine gun. Tom led the counterattack. The battle lasted for 17 hours. During a firefight, two of Tom's team members had been severely wounded and were cut off from the rest of the team, and they were just a few feet from Taliban warriors who wanted to capture them. While Tom was leading uh, the rescue effort, he was mortally wounded by small arms fire. Four Green Berets were killed that night. For his action, uh, Tom received the Bronze Star for Valor, the Purple Heart, and a Silver Star. Tom was survived by his wife and son. I was Tom's <coughs> company sergeant major. Great guy. Art Lilly, 35, Special Forces A Team Team Sergeant, a position earned and never given. Art was a big, strapping, red-headed guy, quiet, serious, and uh, whose demeanor just commanded respect. On 15 June 2007, Art was killed by sniper fire while leading his A-team and a company of Afghan commandos on a mission in Paktika province, Afghanistan. And uh, for his uh, actions, Art received the Bronze Star with the V device for uh, valor. Art survived by his wife, daughter, and son. I again was Art's company sergeant major. Sergeant first, first Class Pedro Munoz, known as Pappy. He was the oldest guy on his team, probably the oldest guy in his company and battalion. Uh, we were born the same year, and uh, he was still at it. Um, Pappy never stopped smiling. That smile, you see, I think he went to bed with and he woke up with. He always had that smile. He was just absolutely the nicest guy you'd want to meet. He was the intelligence sergeant on a Special Forces A team. He left Special Forces for a while to go to the Army's parachute team, the Golden Knights. He had 300 static line jumps and over 4,000 uh, free fall jumps. After 9-11, he immediately came back to Special Forces uh, so he can get into the fight. Uh, he was an accomplished warrior, having served in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And Pappy was killed by enemy uh, small arms fire while conducting uh, offensive operations in Shindan province, Afghanistan. 
He was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry uh, during that operation. He survived by his wife and daughter, Pappy and I were friends. Sergeant First Class Victor Cervantes, he was 27 years old, Special Forces Weapon Sergeant, assigned to the 7th Special Forces Group. Uh, Victor was the epitome of a warrior. As with all Green Berets, he had to be a, a paratrooper first, and from there he went on to Ranger Regiment, and in 2000 he volunteered for Special Forces training. He was killed in Orgun Province in Afghanistan on 10 June 2005 while serving on a quick reaction force responding to enemy contact from another Special Forces team. Victor was uh, awarded the Bronze Star with the V device for valor. He leaves behind a mother, father, and a sister. So some of us, while sitting in a congregation, uh, we honestly cringe when we hear Happy Memorial Day. There's nothing happy about it. It's a time for uh, somber remembrance of those who had given their all, who paid the ultimate price uh, for our freedoms. It's not uh, about the summer kickoff season. It's not about barbecues, although we all have them. Um, it, it's a time that we remember them, and it's a time that we remember the Gold Star families and honor them for their losses. And with that, I'm going to ask Jimmy Eights, who is a Iraq War veteran, to come up and to pray for the Gold Star families, after which I'm going to ask Chipper, who is both a veteran of uh, the Iraq and the Afghanistan's war to pray for our nation. Jimmy. Thank you. As uh, Joe has reminded us, Memorial Day is a day to mourn and remember those who have um, paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is to pray for um, our nation's gold star families. So I just encourage you before I pray, if you happen to know somebody that's grieving or lost a loved one, uh, maybe reach out to them. Um, let them know you're thinking of them, that you're praying for them, uh, or see if they need anything. It could be a great blessing to them. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just uh, so thankful for our nation, um, for the freedoms that you've allowed us to have, the liberty. Um, we're thankful for men and women that um, answer the nation's call and do as our nation directs to keep us safe and preserve our freedoms. Lord, we just want to lift up uh, all those that are grieving um, this Memorial Day weekend. Um, to some, they, they remember at one point they got, somebody came to their door, they got a message and they got delivered horrible news. Whether it was a mother or a father that lost a son or a daughter, Lord, um, just comfort them, um, be with them, give them peace, Lord whether it was a spouse that got the news that either a husband or a wife has been lost, fallen, paid the ultimate sacrifice, left alone to grieve or left to keep living. Um, perhaps they have children, multiple children. Um, the meals don't stop. Um, taking them to school doesn't stop. The things of running a daily household, Lord, it doesn't stop. Lord, for those spouses, I pray that you'll give them comfort You'll give them peace. You'll take care of them financially. And uh, you'll just use them um, just to be a godly influence um, to their children and their family. And, Lord, for those children, we think of them that are left without either a father or a mother. Lord, um, comfort these children. Take care of these children. I pray that you'll um, take care of them financially. Um, that you'll bring people into their lives that are godly influences to them, um, that you'll comfort and you'll care for them. And uh, we also just want to pray for the souls of um, our nation's Gold Star family members. Um, those that are yours, Lord, I pray that you will give them peace and use this situation to bring others to you, um, to show your love to others. And, Lord, for those that are not yours, I just pray that you'll use this situation to bring them um, to Jesus Christ, Lord. Um, bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And now Chipper is going to come up and pray for our nation. Let's 
go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for a time to come here and to worship you. Lord, we acknowledge that all of us here are as uh, come to you as sinners in need of your grace. Lord, we are often falling short of that. And Lord, we thank you for having called us away from our sins. And Lord, having given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And having met our greatest need at the cross and by your resurrection, proving that you are indeed the only Savior. And Lord, as, um, as we don't know what to say on the time, I guess it's a time we've been conditioned to act in certain ways, a condition to look at it as another holiday, a day off. And yet, Lord, there's a very serious purpose behind it. You have told us to render credit to whom credit is due, honor to whom honor. And Lord, uh, you've also told us there's a time to weep and a time to mourn. There's also a time of joy. Lord, there are times that we like to skip over the painful parts. I pray, Lord, that we would not run from the house of mourning. But Lord, in your word, you have instructed us that by the sorrow of the heart, the, the, the sorrow of the countenance, the heart is made better. We are made better when we dwell on the truths, even those things that seem hard to deal with. And Lord, as I thought about it, um, what's going on and the, the way that uh, Memorial Day and the, uh, what's going on with the Gold Star families, Lord, I realize that it can seem like sometimes people think of you as separate and away from them and not really near to their suffering. And yet, Lord, I was reminded of your word again that says, you that spared not your own son but delivered him up for us all. And Lord, that means that you, you know pain, you know loss. You allowed a friend to die. And while, yes, you have the power to, to rise him from the dead, Lord, by your will, you also allowed him to pass, Lord. You allowed pain into someone's life on purpose. And it's for an eternal purpose that we don't understand, but we do acknowledge you as the ultimate wise God who knows all things will work together for good to those that love you. And Lord, I pray that you would help <clears throat> our nation as a whole. We certainly don't deserve your grace. We didn't deserve these men. We didn't deserve them to stand in our midst and stand in our stead on, on a battlefield far away and, and take bullets that could have gone anywhere. Um, we don't deserve them who uh, were going about their daily business and uh, just happened to, uh, it was their day. It was their time to, to be called into eternity. Lord, I pray, Lord, first of all, for uh, the souls of those men who remain Lord, those who are soldiers, those who are serving our country, Lord, I pray that you would help them realize the need of salvation, the need of, of repentance and faith towards you. Uh, Lord, that they would not, that you would not let them rest, that, Lord, you would uh, convict and continue to allow others to be in their lives to show them the truth of the gospel. Lord, I do pray for the families that have lost people. I know that the burden is heavier today for those who know loss. And I ask you to just help them, comfort them, comfort your children, Lord. You have said that you, you are near to those who are of a broken heart. And so, Lord, I pray that those who know you would realize and dwell and be comforted by that truth. But, Lord, those who don't, I pray that you would use this in their life to draw them closer to the cross, to their own salvation. I do pray for our nation, Lord. I don't know what to say as far as that. Lord, I know that many times it seems we are continuing on roads that lead to destruction. And we deserve your judgment and wrath, and uh, bad things happen, and the more that one might think or one might conclude that we deserve every bit that's coming to us, and yet we know that, Lord, that's not true. We deserve worse. And God, we pray, we confess that as Christians, we are part of that problem. We are supposed to be light. We're supposed to be salt. Instead, we're acting certain ways. We're, we're living like the world. We're, not, we're being conformed to its image. We're not conformed to yours. And Lord, you, as you taught us to confess our sins, to own up to what we are doing, Help us to do that personally, corporately, Lord. We realize that we don't do the things that we should do. And yet, Lord, I was also reminded this morning of the passage of Nehemiah that, Lord, in the midst of true and just and righteous judgment, as we've learned, you are always just in all things that you do. We ask that, God, even though you know we deserve this and worse, everything that's happening to our country, everything that has happened, all the loss and pain that has been recent and that's gone on throughout our history, Lord, especially recently, we acknowledge, God, that it hurts, and we know that you know it hurts. And we ask that you would not think it's small, as Nehemiah said. All these things that have befallen us, even though we deserve it, we ask you to be with us even in the midst of perhaps even well-deserved uh, uh, chastisement, well-deserved uh, consequence of our own sins. 
as a nation. I pray that your church would shine brighter and brighter, that, Lord, we would turn our hearts from darkness to light, that the gospel would reign as it has reigned in our hearts, that it would reign in those of others. Lord, bring revival, even in the midst of wrath, remember, remember mercy. Lord, bring revival to our country. We don't know how you'll do that. But we thank you that you can and will and have done it in the past, and we ask you to do it again. Use us in our communities. Use us in our own areas as, Lord, we seek to touch people with the gospel, Lord. Reach out to them. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your will and your leading and to purify ourselves even as you are pure. Lord, we thank you for the nation we have. And we thank you for the good things that it has done. And I pray that there will be more good things that it can do. But, Lord, I pray that it will be humble enough to admit it has some serious problems right now. And so, Lord, finally, I just pray for the leadership. I pray that each person in the leadership of this country would look to you, touch their hearts in some way, shape, or form, that they might know you. We pray for their souls. If their souls are right, the rest will follow. We know that. We thank you for this time, Lord, and the, the, so the remainder of the service. We ask you be with us. Convict hearts that need convicting, Lord. Comfort hearts that need comforting. But above all, Lord, that your will will be done and your name be glorified. It's in that name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. There we go. We're going to begin our worship service now by singing Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let's stand as we sing. We've had some changes in the schedule, so excuse the hiccups this morning, Stuart. All right, so just a couple of announcements that we do want to touch on, and then we'll continue with the uh, worship service. Uh, we do have a discussion uh, group leader for the different discussion groups. We have new groups uh, coming next week, and so we just need to have a brief meeting right after the service before the meal uh, with those discussion leaders, and uh, we'll meet back in the classroom back here. Uh, so we'll just take just a couple of minutes for that. 
And then also, uh, you'll notice just uh, there with the teen announcements, but also the, uh, the lock-in has been rescheduled for June 17th. And then the Royalty Club meetings that we'll have there in June and July, so be aware of that. And then also for the Summer Kids Club, we, uh, on Wednesday evenings, uh, it seems to be going well. We started that off this past Wednesday. And so if you would like to help with that, uh, we did have a lot of uh, volunteers this year, which we're really excited for. But if you'd be uh, willing to help and uh, jump in with that, let, uh, you can talk to me or talk to Mrs. DeHaven and we'll be able to get you on that schedule. Uh, for our next song is Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. We'll have Joe come and lead that. You remain seated. And uh, I do appreciate the, the beginning and trust that you understand the difference Memorial Day and then Veterans Day. You see that uh, posted a lot of time. Veterans Day, we thank all of those who have served in the military. And Memorial Day is especially remembering those who, uh, in memoriam, we have lost. And uh, I appreciate taking the time to start our service to note that. Um, before we take the offering, uh, two things. One, uh, in your bulletin, there's a note in the uh, remember section, and I'm not going to spend any time on that today, uh, but just uh, if you have not registered to vote, make sure that you uh, do that. We'll actually have a day you can do it here at church. We'll have some computers set up, but we're in a different district now, and I haven't said much about that, but you'll need to, to be aware of that. And we have some folks in West Virginia too, so make sure you know uh, where you vote and, and uh, are clear on that. When the census came out, it shifted some things, and there's always a, a long-term battle over getting things settled after that. For uh, So in 10 years, we'll, we'll do it again. Um, then we have a couple of folks that are visiting. Where is Laura Kennedy? Laura is over here. Um, actually, Joe, you want to introduce the guest here today. Do you like the guy? That's always good. All right. And, uh, we're thankful he's going to be a part of our family. So. Amen. Well, great. And congratulations to them. Uh, wedding on the 29th of July, correct? 29th of July out in Salt Lake. And so great to have them visiting today. Good to have an opportunity. A lot of you don't know Laura. She's been uh, in Salt Lake and then was in China for a while and is back to Salt Lake. And so it's good to have them visiting with us today. Um, and then John uh, has his sister, Mary Ann, here as well, and so it's good to have her visiting today, and she'll be around for a while, so it's good to have her uh, visiting in our service today as well. Gentlemen, if you'll go ahead and come, we're going to take the offering. Um, we pray for some folks each week, and so today we'll pray for Joe Willis, one of our missionaries, a chaplain with the 
uh, Foundations Baptist Fellowship International, working with uh, military and chaplains in, in police and, and fire departments, a number of different places. And then Pastor Ingmeyer, uh, who's at Independent Baptist Church up in Blairsville, Pennsylvania. We'll pray for him today. And then our state senator, Jill Vogel. And then, of course, we want to pray for the families down in Uvalde, Texas. So many of you have prayed for them. And uh, we always get the question, you know, how could God let that happen? And that is something that I hope you understand theology well enough to know. God can stop anything he wants, uh, but there is a freedom to act that he has given us, and sometimes we see people do some horrible things, and uh, that is one of them. And so uh, we see hearts that are without God, and people will do things that are reprehensible when that happens. And the victims of that are the ones that we especially want to pray for. And so as we pray today, uh, we'll pray for those families and even for opportunities for people who know the, the Lord uh, to minister to those families down there. Bob, will you come pray for us, please? Let us pray. Oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the love that you show us. Thank you for the wisdom that you give us. Thank you, Lord, for the, your presence in our lives. Lord, I ask that you be with us and that you be with our country and that you strengthen those that are in leadership that are trying to serve you and that you touch the hearts of those in leadership that aren't to sway them back to you. Lord, we ask that you be with Joe Willis as he works on your behalf. And also ask that you be with Rob Ingmeyer and that you give him the message for his congregation that you want them to have. And Lord, I ask that you be with State Senator Jill Vogel and that you continue to guide her and, and direct her and help her, Lord, to, to legislate and lead in the path that you want her to. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. scripture reading this morning is Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 21. Revelation 19 verse 11 it says, And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him white horses, clothed in uh, fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. And he said, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the, of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the heaven with their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. May God add his reading to may, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word.
the beginning of the service, we had um, honored uh, over 600,000 Americans who had given their lives for our freedoms and the freedom of our country. Uh, this morning, uh, we sing a song that we honor the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for mankind that we might be freed from sin and freed from uh, the bondage of sin, freed from hell, and have eternal life. So let's stand together as we sing the power of the cross. Think of the words as you sing it. Let it be a, a, a worshipful song and prayer from your heart to the Lord this morning. Sing it as a prayer from your heart to the ear of the Lord, thanking him for what he's done on the cross. you ever had somebody tell you that you need to watch this movie or read this book or go to this store, or buy this brand or, I don't know, a recipe, and they just kind of keep after, after you to do something? They're always annoying you with trying to get you to do something. If I could be that person for you with this song, I would. Um, I've probably listened to this song 150 times over the last year, and it's something that God's really used in my heart. Probably need to listen to it a lot more because I don't think I've got it figured out yet. But it packs a lot of scripture into it, and I encourage you to get songs in your life when you're going through things or you're not going through things that can really help you. Um, but it really faces, uh, forces you to face a question, to ask yourself if you're actually trusting God, 
if it's not something that you just saying that you're doing, but if your life backs up the fact that you do trust him. Amen. Great message to that song. I feel like we could give an invitation after that. If you read the words to that, you know that there are times that you simply have to trust the Lord, that he is going to guide you through some things and that he is our heavenly father and loves and cares for us deeply. Let's go ahead and turn back to Revelation 19. And as we're doing that, if you are three years old through the third grade, uh, you'll go with Mr. Davidson back here today. And he and a couple of other folks will have things set up for you this morning over in the other building. So I love getting to this place in Revelation because it is... A transition today from what has been for a long time some really I guess we would call it hard and negative things that we have to read in the book of Revelation uh, we go through uh, a long section where he talks about the tribulation and it truly is a tribulation I'll mention a little bit more about that in just a second but I love coming to this chapter because 
um, we have the Lord Jesus Christ stepping into the spotlight. I mean, he's got the spotlight already, uh, and we know he's there, and, and, and the stage and the, the show is all about him. But uh, in this passage, he's actually going to walk onto the stage and say, here I am. And he's going to introduce himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Jesus Christ is the one who then is going to take center stage and he's going to do some things uh, over the course of the next thousand years that are going to be unique in the course of history. And so as we come to this passage, uh, we have anticipated this second coming for a long time. And you know, sometimes anticipating something is as much the joy as actually doing it. Um, a lot of people are like that with a trip. Um, you know, I've gotten to travel a lot, and sometimes you anticipate that I'm going to get to go somewhere. I remember that in getting to go to Jerusalem the first time, getting to spend some time in the Holy Land. Uh, even uh, with some other vacations, you anticipate what's coming up, and just looking forward to it is sometimes what keeps you going. Um, I was talking to, to Dave Channel this morning before church, and, and, and I asked him how he was, and he gave the standard greeting or the standard answer, fine, and that's what we all say, but then he said, one day closer to vacation. So, I mean, that's a good way to look at. Anticipation is there. Uh, it's coming. You know something's uh, arriving. All the way through the Bible, you have anticipation of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the Old Testament, um, I'm reading uh, Ezekiel right now, and I'm about a third of the way through it, and all the way through Ezekiel, he tells them, you're going to go into captivity, but there is the unequivocal promise to them that he is going to fulfill those covenants that he made with Abraham. And although you look at, at it and say, well, Israel could never do this or that at this point, God said, I'm going to do that. And his promises are there, and so you can anticipate what's going to happen. I mentioned the tragedy down in Texas before. Sometimes when you look at, at things from a day-to-day -day perspective, you just look at what happened yesterday, what happened the day before, what happens today, and, and some of the things that, that might happen even tomorrow, you can get extremely discouraged. And you can begin to think, is there a God? Is he really in charge? Are things going to come out okay? Well, what I will tell you is this, that if you can come to the place where you will live in light of end time promises, you will be an overcomer. John talked about overcomers in his epistles. And he said, you can be an overcomer when you live in light of end time promises. Sometimes day to day things get really hard and really long. But when you look at the big picture, you can have confidence that God has all, thing, all these things in control, and at some point, he will set everything straight. Now, we're going to do an entire chapter again today, and so obviously it's going to be uh, some chunks of things that we're going to look at. But I want you to look, if you have your Bible, you're going to see that in chapter 19, there are actually four very clear divisions. There are four events that he's going to talk about, four things that he brings up. And if we were doing it simply from an academic perspective, where we said, okay, here is what uh, is taking place. We would look at it in a classroom and, and just simply divide it into these four. And we'll actually do that some today as I put it on the screen up here. Um, that there are four divisions in this chapter, four, um, in, in essence, four uh, events or four actions that are going to take place. And John has the privilege of seeing those and then relaying those four to us, saying, here's what you need to know. Now let's keep it in, in its sequence. Well, uh, let's introduce the first one for, uh, before we start that. Uh, Pastor Rogers read for us, starting in verse 11, so we need to go back and pick up verse 1. So go to chapter 19 and verse 1, and he says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, I'm reading this in King James. We're going to put it up in New American Standard up on the screen in just a minute. But you're going to find that there is a word that's repeated four times here. Um, if you look at verse 1, we saw it. There's a, a, a voice of much people in heaven saying, 
Alleluia. Now, if you have a King James Version, it will be Alleluia. If you have um, a, a New American Standard or ESV, it usually has Hallelujah, an H in front of it, same word. It's just a little different uh, spelling of it. Uh, but this is the word that you say, Hallelujah. You know, we're, we're very uh, used to that word. The word itself actually means praise the Lord or praise ye the Lord. Uh, we're most familiar with the Hallelujah chorus that we often sing at Christmas, but it's a, 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 a chorus that comes out of Revelation. Um, now look in your Bible and you're going to see that he uses that word in verse 1. Uh, he's going to use it again in verse 3, and again they said, Alleluia. And then he's going to use it again in verse 4. Uh, you'll see it at, usually at the end of the verse, Alleluia. And you're going to see it again uh, in verse 6 where you have Alleluia. Now, my Bible, I underlined those four times in red. Now, I sit at my desk, and I have pens there, so I, I can do that, but I've got those four underlined in red, and there's a reason for that. Because that is the only time this word is used in the entire New Testament. Now, it's used a couple of times in the Old Testament in Hebrew, but it's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And the only time it's used in the New Testament is here in these six verses. You don't find it anywhere else. And so you have a fourfold Alleluia. You have God pulling back the curtain of heaven again. And I love these little glimpses he gives us into what's going on around the throne of God and what's happening in heaven. And it is literally a fourfold hallelujah. That you've come to the place in heaven where they said, hallelujah, it's time. The end has come and Jesus Christ is going to, to come and take his rightful place. And you have to kind of imagine that here in heaven, you've got these people who are finally crying out, Alleluia. Now, before we get to that, I want you to notice something that's important for us as students of Revelation. Look at the very first line of the very first verse in chapter 19. He says, and after these things. You say, wow, that's, it. that's exhilarating. No, that's important from a study point of view. Because here again... We have in Revelation an indication that these things are sequential or they're chronological. Uh, I would rather in Revelation use the word sequential because he doesn't really, uh, there's a little bit of a difference between sequ sequence and chronology, and he's giving us things sequentially. And so when you read these uh, verses and you realize he's saying, okay, after these things, well, what things? Well, he just described the fall of Babylon in chapters 17 and 18, and he described the pouring out of those bowls or vials of judgment, and now he's saying, after these things and so it gives us a sequence of events and so when you're looking at this you realize that we can go through the book of revelation and we can say all right i have an order of events although he doesn't give us every detail he gives us a good order and if you'll go back in your mind you'll remember that at the very beginning of revelation he laid this out for us revelation 1 19 he made this statement Therefore, write the, the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after. And you remember that he's already started in Revelation 1. What had he seen? Well, he saw a vision of Jesus Christ. That vision is going to come up again today because uh, here comes the rider on the white horse and that description, uh, a lot of what he said in chapter 1 is carried forward to chapter 19. Then he said in verses 2 and 3, I'm going to tell you the things which are. Remember those seven churches? And he said, I'm looking around and I'm seeing these seven literal local churches and let me give you an evaluation of those churches. And so Jesus Christ evaluates those churches. Then we have this really long section. And I got to tell you, I'm probably as happy as anybody to be through the section. Because in, from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 22, he really is focusing on the 70th seven, the seven-year tribulation. And during this tribulation, he is telling us all the, the judgment that he's going to pour out on the earth, trying to get people to turn their attention to him. And sometimes it's hard to read. We've got this wonderful picture of things that are happening in heaven. 
And he tells us in chapter 4, verse 1, as far as we can tell, it's the rapture when he takes his church to heaven with him because he never mentions the church again in the rest of the book of Revelation. It's not mentioned at all. And so as far as we can tell, the church is gone. The focus is back on Israel. And so now he's fo focused our attention on these last seven years. And he says, let me tell you some of the things that are going to happen in that seven years. And by reading Revelation, you can get the sequence of events. You know that there are going to be the trumpets, and then you're going to have the seals, and then you're going to have the bowls. Now you have a lot of questions in there. But as you have those trumpets and those seals and those bowls, then he comes toward the end and he says, now he gives us a lot of sequence here. He said toward the end of that, he said in the, the last three and a half years, you're going to have this beast and false prophet that are going to show up. And you're going to find people worshiping this beast and false prophet. And they're going to deceive the entire world, although there are going to be people saved during that time because there are martyrs. And so he gives us a wonderful sequence of events. And so sometimes we study it in detail and we miss the fact that he actually gives us a really good sequence of events. And in this third section, he says from chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 19, verse 21, we're going to talk about the tribulation. So today we're going to finish the discussion of the tribulation and it's a wonderful finish. Now, uh, we won't do it next week, but the following week, the week after that, I'm trying to think when Father's Day is, because I think we do miss that, we'll talk about the millennium. And then there's only one section after that where he talks about the eternal state, where we talk about the new heaven and the new earth. And so things really look up from here. We have a picture of what's going to happen in the very end of time on this earth. But here in chapter 19, he said, I want you to understand that in heaven, once all of these things have taken place, once, the, once these uh, judgments have been poured out, and once Babylon has been destroyed, the people are not up there going, oh, poor Babylon. They're actually up there saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. God has poured out judgment on these people who hate him. These people who have their own agenda, people who will not focus on what God wants them to do. And when you begin to read this, you find in verse 1 that it says there's a great multitude in heaven. Now, I need you to practice this morning. Uh, we might be doing this in heaven. So can you do this with me? When I've got the word hallelujah up here and we read it, I want you to be the grand, grand chorus in heaven, okay? All right, I know this stirs us up on Sunday morning. All right, so there's a great multitude in heaven, and they're saying, Ah, oh, you guys did well. All right, yeah, hallelujah. Why? Why are we praising the Lord? Well, because he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. God has finally judged this world. There is a corrupt world that is turning people away from God. And oh, how the angels must look at God and say, why would you let that happen? And God said, I'm going to judge them. And over and over, you could look at God and, and say, why did you let him be killed? Why did you let her be killed? She was one of your great servants. And God says, hold on, I'm going to judge. But here is the, the multitude in heaven, and they've watched as God has judged this great harlot. Remember, he called her that, uh, called Babylon that in chapters 17 and 18. You go on, and in verse 3, it says a second time they said... See, you're awake. Good. All right. So they said a second time, hallelujah. Why? Her smoke rises up forever and ever. She's going to suffer forever. And they're not saying, oh, this is terrible. They, they're saying she has received what she deserved. This is God's justice being poured out. This is what you deserve. He goes on then in verse 4 and he says, <clears throat> 24 elders <clears throat> and four living creatures. Now, uh, this stretches your mind all the way back to chapters 4 and 5 when you drew your picture. Remember you had the throne and around it you had the 24 elders <clears throat> and the four living beasts. And those probably represent the church. A little bit hard to know, but, but I would agree with that, that that probably represents the church. And so you have these 24 elders and four living creatures, and they're crying out, Amen! Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. And then it says, a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God. Here again, praise is being poured out to God because of what he has done, because of what he has accomplished. And you come then to verse 6 and it says there's a voice of a great multitude. We don't know if this is a different group or it's added to the group, but there's a voice of a great multitude saying, hallelujah. boy, here we go. Why? Why are we crying out hallelujah? For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. This is anticipatory. They're looking around, and I don't know if they see the Lord Jesus over there saddling his horse. I don't know if he actually has to do that. It doesn't say he has a saddle. But somehow they sense time has now ended. The seven years are done. And they're asked, anticipating as maybe Jesus stands up off the throne and he calls for his horse. Come on over here, white horse. We got something to do today. And they're saying, our God reigns. He's had enough. Time is up. And it's now time for him to return. And the second coming is imminent. Now, before he tells us about the second coming, he gives us something else that we need to understand. We've got the fourfold hallelujah. And at this point, after we've heard this, you understand proper exaltation of our holy God. That when God judges people, it is praise to him that he has held people accountable uh, for their lack of holiness in light of his holiness. But he moves us to something else in verses 7 through 10. Again, Pastor Rogers didn't read this, and so let's go to that. Let me read it to you. Again, I'll read it in King James, and then uh, we'll put a little bit of this up on the screen. It says in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright or white. For the linen is the righteousness of the saints. And actually that probably is better, the righteous acts of the saints. And I'll come back to that. And he says to, says, saith to them, write, blessed are they which are, are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto, unto me, These are the true sayings, or true words, of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And otherwise, in other words, when you uh, prophesy, you're going to come to Jesus is the idea. But let's think about what he said here. You've probably heard about the marriage supper of the Lamb. I tell people one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that we have uh, church dinners is we're actually preparing for heaven. You know, we're going to have a marriage supper up there. I don't know if you'll have chicken. I'm not sure what we'll have. But at some point, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, a little bit of information for you here. Um, we have weddings. Um, Somebody's planning one over here. How's that planning going? You good with it? Okay, all right, yeah. So we do a wedding, and, you know, uh, they, Todd, Todd, right? Got Todd and Laura. They got engaged, and, you know, the wedding is planned. That's not how a wedding worked, in the Old Testament especially, and, and even during Jesus' day. There were actually three stages to a wedding. First, there was the legal part of it. And so uh, the parents would get together and they would make an agreement including a dowry. And so uh, Melissa over here has some sons and daughters. And so she might say, I got this guy named Michael and I need to marry him off. And so I got to find somebody with a girl. And so we find some other family with a girl and, and, and Mike and, and Melissa, they get together and they uh, make this arrangement and get the dowry and say, okay, there you go. Michael, we found you a wife. A little different than what we normally do today, but that was the way it worked. And you remember even Samson, when he went out, uh, he said, I found a woman I like, go and get her for me. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, this is what he meant. Uh, he couldn't just go and propose like Todd did. 
he had to actually go send his parents to talk to her parents and they made a legal agreement and a dowry the whole works now the second thing that happened and this was especially a new testament con concept remember the parable of the virgins the next stage of that was that the the groom came to get his bride and often he came to get her after he had gone home and he had prepared a place. Often he added a room onto his parents' house. And he would build that room onto his parents' house. And, and once it was prepared, then he and his attendants would come back and they would come to the bride's house and they would get that bride and they would bring her back to his house where they would have a multi-day feast. That was the third stage. Now, when you think about the marriage of the Lamb, that's the picture he uses. There is a legal agreement already in place, and that is those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior have been adopted into the family of God. We have had our sin placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, His righteousness placed upon us. We're saved. And he said, I am at some time coming to get you. That's the rapture as it is pictured. I'm going to snatch you away. I'm going to come and I'm going to take my bride and you're going to come to my place and we're going to have the marriage supper. As far as we can tell, that's what he's talking about here. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. When Paul's talking about the church, he said, I want a pure church to present to the Lord Jesus Christ at the wedding feast. Uh, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Many of you are familiar with these verses. It says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, so that he might sanctify or set her apart and cleanse her having washed her with the water by the word, so that he might present to himself a church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. As far as we can tell, this is the time he's talking about. He's saying there's a point where we're going to offer her at the marriage supper. We're going to say, here's my church and the marriage of the Lamb. And this marriage of the Lamb, she's going to come and she's clothed, not necessarily simply in the righteousness of Christ, but in the righteous acts of the saints. It would seem that the judgment seat of Christ has already taken place, and you are actually clothed in your righteous acts. That's an interesting thing to think through. Are you going to have any righteous acts, serve, uh, things that you've done as you've served the Lord, that you're going to be clothed with that? And then he goes on and he says, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is why I'm a dispensationalist. Not everybody is invited. There's Israel and there's the church. There are people who are saved in the tribulation that won't be there. But there is a specific group that will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In verse 10 it tells us he, he was so overwhelmed by this that he fell down and he started to worship the angel. And the angel said, no, no, don't worship me. I'm just the, I'm just the one telling you this. And here's the second thing that we learn out of these events. You'll enjoy a proper relationship with your holy God. He will consummate this. He'll bring us to the place where we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is at that point then that where Pastor Roger started reading today, we have the coming of Christ. And if you would imagine it, it is at this point he mounts the white horse. And John describes it for us. And there's not much more I need to say about it. Go back to the scripture again. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many diadems or crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed 
with a vesture or a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Wow, what a picture. I saw heaven opened and a white horse, and now he's making his way to earth. And there's a little verse there that says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed with fi in fine linen, white and clean. Who are those armies? Well, we'll have to tackle that another day. But there's an army following him. This white horse out in front, and then behind him, his soldiers, as though it were. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. There's a battle now for who's the king of kings. Who's going to take over? The beast is going to try to do it. The false prophet. I want to read this to you. It's one of two things I'll read out of the Bible knowledge commentary. It says, The scene on earth is the final stage of the great world war that will be underway for many weeks. I told you about that last week. It's not simply one battle. It's a terrible war that will culminate in, in the Lord coming back. With armies battling up and down the Holy Land for victory. On the very day of the return of Christ, there will be house-to-house -house fighting in Jerusalem itself. Combatants will have been lured to the battle site by demons sent by Satan to assemble the armies of the world to fight the armies of heaven. What a picture. But here are the demons who have assembled everybody they have to defeat Jesus Christ. And oh, here's John, and he says, I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And he goes on down and he said, out of his mouth came a sword. This is not a short dagger. This is a long sword that sometimes can be used as a spear. And he said that with it, he'll smite the nations. And he proves himself not just to be the Lord, but he proves himself to be the king of kings and Lord of lords. And this is the end of the tribulation. This is what's going to happen the second coming of Christ, and you'll enjoy the victory of our holy God. Well, there's one last thing that he's going to tell us about in this passage. In verses 17 through 21, he said, let me give you the final act on that day of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll put it on the screen for you. It says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both men and slaves and small and great." He calls the, the turkey buzzards and the vultures, and he says, you're going to need to gather because I'm going to need you to do a little cleanup job for me. And then here's what he said happens. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And so here it is, the pinnacle now. Satan has gathered all of his forces he has marshaled everybody he has to the, the Holy Land. And he says, we're going to defeat Christ. And we're going to win. We're going to finally take over. And the next verse tells us what happens. And the beast was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh boy here's the final judgment here's what happens there's no long drawn out war 
Satan and the, the armies he's marshaled, he doesn't have a, stand a chance. It says very simply, the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet. Uh, all of his armies out in front of him to keep him from being uh, taken. Uh, we used to play a dodgeball game called King and Queen Dodgeball. And that's where you, you would choose somebody as your king. And you'd have him over here like where Ricky is, and he's your king. And, and they're throwing dodgeballs at him. And all the rest of the people on your team have to stand in front of him to make sure he doesn't get hit. You take the, the, the hit for him. And here's Satan's army, and they're going to defend their, their beast and their false prophet. And the scripture simply says that Christ comes on his white horse, and he goes, whoosh, and he seizes him. He takes the beast and he casts him alive. And then he reaches over and he grabs the false prophet and he casts him alive into the lake of fire. And then he takes his sword and it's over. There's no long drawn out battle. There's no time when you think, well, maybe Christ will lose. It's just over. He's destroyed all of them. And that's why at the beginning... They're looking out and they're saying, hallelujah, it's finally going to happen. All of these things that we endure while we're on the earth, those are going to be over. The false prophet, the beast, they're done. We'll enjoy the proper judgment of the enemies of our holy God. I told you I wanted to read a second thing to you, and it's on two slides here, and, and this will be what I'll end with today. I want you to think about these words. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, it makes this statement. The same inspired Word of God which so wonderfully describes the grace of God and the salvation which is available to all who believe is equally plain about the judgment of all who reject the grace of God. The tendency of liberal interpreters of the Bible to emphasize passages dealing with the love of God and to ignore passages dealing with His righteous judgment is completely unjustified. The passages on judgment are just as inspired and accurate as those which develop the doctrines of grace and salvation. The Bible is clear that judgment awaits the wicked and the second coming of Christ is the occasion for the worldwide judgment unparalleled in Scripture since the time of Noah's flood. Listen, if you'll think about it, you can be an overcomer. But you'll be an overcomer when you live in light of end time promises. I'm not on the losing side. I'm on the winning side. And if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if your sin is forgiven, man, we've got a great future. If you haven't, you need to do that. Trust Him to take care of your sin, to pay the penalty for you. And then as believers, we can never lose sight of the fact that we're on the winning side. And when Jesus Christ steps into the spotlight, I want to be with those in heaven who are shouting out, what? Hallelujah. It's time. Jesus Christ, in his patience and his kindness, has allowed man every opportunity to trust him as Savior. And now it's time. He has judged the sinner as he deserves. And what a wonderful thing it is for you and for me to be able to say, I'm going to be an overcomer because I am living in light of the end time promises. Let's bow for prayer, please. Now, with our heads bowed <clears throat> this morning, there may be somebody who needs to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. But here is a passage that's as clear as we can get it about what the end will be. And I encourage you this morning to respond to the Lord's grace and His kindness, His call to you. But as Christians, we can be overcomers. We're on the side that will win, and I trust that you will keep your perspective, keep your focus on Him. In just a moment, we're going to stand, and as we do each week, I'm going to ask you to say, Lord, here's what you've taught me today, and here's how I'm going to respond. And I trust today that you'll understand what God wants you to do each day. Let's stand together, please. Now, Father, as we're standing before you, we recognize that you 
are supreme in all things. And Lord, we look to the future and know that you will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we have allied ourselves with you. You have allowed us to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And so keep our focus firmly planted upon him. And Lord, I pray that you'll accomplish in our lives what you want to accomplish. Now with our heads bowed, will you take the time and just talk to the Lord. Say, here's what you've taught me and here's how I'm going to respond. you can look this way and as always if you need to talk to somebody please feel free to do that i'm going to ask you to be seated we're going to finish our service this morning with communion so let me ask our men to go ahead and come